Lord, we thank you for this new day, and we thank you for the chance to meet and the chance to study and the chance to talk. And we pray, Lord, that you would um, be with us as we continue to walk through the book of Romans, and especially this, uh, really this high point of the book of Romans, Romans 8. We pray that you would guide us and uh, give us insight and open the eyes of our heart. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. We're in Romans 8, and we're talking about spirit. We talked about it a lot last week. Um, three ways to sort of conceptualize this is spirit within and spirit between and spirit um, that is outside. We're, we're looking at really, I think, the climax of this first main section of the book of Romans, where Paul is, his argument really starts in chapter, in chapter one, um, one through three, it's basically fall, and four and five, it's Abraham and faith, 6 through 8a, beginning of 8, you have this idea of flesh and spirit, especially with respect to law. And now in the second half of chapter 8, we have the climax, which is finally the restoration of everything that he's talked about in the beginning. It's not only the salvation of our souls, but it's the renewal of the world. And so because Paul has placed so much emphasis on this, um, on the word spirit, especially as opposed to flesh, and because so much has changed over the history of the last 2,000 years of this book with respect to our imagination of what we mean by this word spirit, we are struggling with how to understand this. So we're in the middle of the chapter. Um, and let's start, we'll start at verse six. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace because the mindset of the flesh is enmity towards God for it was not subjected to the law of God, but it is um, not able to do so. And those who are in the flesh are not able to please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this person does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also make alive your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. And in many ways, Verse 11 is key to this whole understanding of how does spirit finally address fall? Paul will deal with that again in, actually deal, dealt with it previously, um, in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul talks about us being raised with a spiritual body. The difficulty we have in our current moment is that if you ask someone, um, I saw a spiritual body, they will at this point imagine you mean immaterial. And because you tend to differentiate spirit between matter, which is a fine differentiation, but they will imagine they see a ghost. And this is part of the reason that in the resurrection stories, 
one of the first things Jesus wants to emphasize with the apostles is, I am not a ghost. Now, what is a ghost? What's a ghost? It's, it's, a, it's the spiritual residue of a human being. It's a dead person. It's a spiritual manifestation of a dead person that takes on um, certain characteristics, sound or sight, something like that. That's what a ghost is. So when, for example, in the book of Acts, Peter has been jailed. The apostles are praying. They're probably assuming he's been killed. And then Peter shows up at the door. Um, the slave girl that went to check on the door comes back and basically thinks it's Peter's ghost. Peter says, it's not a ghost. And you might say, well, ghosts don't knock. But usually if you have ghost stories, knocking is one of the things that ghosts seem to do all the time. I heard a knocking noise. And, and the point here is that we're not talking about spirit in that way. What we're talking about is the kind of obedience to spirit that matter should have. Last week, I talked about the rustling of the tree of the leaves outside that. And I used the metaphor, I used what Jesus said in John chapter three about if you look outside, you can't see the breeze right now. It's a very faint breeze that's moving that that's moving those leaves. But we know there is a faint breeze because we see the leaves move. So what we say is basically, well, remember spirit wind used to be the same word. The spirit is moving the leaves, okay? And when it comes to human beings, I talked about this in the sermon last week. This is C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. My spirit is moving my hand. I can put up fingers. I can put it back and forth. I can hold a pen. My hand and this pen are subject to my spirit. It seems to be the simplest thing. But this is what Paul is talking about with respect to spirit and the creation. That what happens in the fall is that humanity rebels against God and creation rebels against humanity. That you have a break in this chain of command and what happens in Christ with the Spirit of God coming in is that the chain of command is restored. And it's for this Jesus, it's for this reason that Jesus does the kinds of miracles he does. Every day, water is turned into wine. And if you want to see it, drive to Napa Valley or just down south of Sacramento, and you can watch water being turned to wine. Now, when we watch water being turned to wine, we say, oh, well, there's this irrigation district, and there's this irrigating these vines out there, and the water goes into the vines and becomes grapes, and the grapes go into a barrel, and in the barrel they ferment, and out of the, out of the barrel comes wine. And so every day water is turned into wine. Jesus turns water into wine with just a command. In other words, you don't hear me commanding my hand, do you? Yeah, I'm not hand? Five fingers. No, no, no. There's no, there's no audible. The, the, my hand doesn't obey my words. My hand obeys my spirit. And it's this that we have to get into our mind with respect to what Paul is talking about in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, now also notice, living in you, because the spirit isn't just a force, the spirit is alive. Last week, Anselman um, in the chat complained that, well, the spirit is a person. Yes, the spirit is a person. The spirit lives in you. You are living in communion with that spirit. It is not possession where your spirit is destroyed by the Holy Spirit. That is not how this works. It is not that one operating system is deleted from the computer, Windows is taken out, and Linux is put in. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes 
and we then are in communion with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit doesn't obliterate us. The Holy Spirit completes us, perfects us, transforms us, but we ourselves don't go away, okay? And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. One of the big fights in church history is over does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father or the Father and the Son? And this verse right here, hmm. So it's the Spirit of God and it's the Spirit of Christ. I don't want to wade into deep Trinitarian questions, but here's, well, this is the Spirit of Christ that is in me. And it's the Spirit of God that's in me, but my spirit is not obliterated. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Remember I talked about how the Spirit doesn't obliterate us? If I, you know, if so if I'm hanging out with Rick, and Rick's a pretty nerdy guy, and Rick might say, you know, I, I don't want to be beholden to Microsoft for what I do, so I'm going to... Even though my computer came with Windows, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to put on Linux, and I'm going to run Linux. It is not the replacement of our operating system. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by which our spirit gets transformed. Now, again, back to Romans 7. We would like to imagine, well, you have flesh and you have spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, flesh is no more. Not usually. Not usually. It's usually a process of growth. And in that process of growth, there are, you know, you fall back, you have um, strides forward, it's back and forth. And, and again, we are not sort of obliterated by the Holy Spirit and a new operating system installed. We now have our spirit and the Holy Spirit in communion, but we're going back and forth. And we have times when Um, We seem to be growing well in times when we seem to not be growing well. And so it's, it's not just cut and dried. But part of the difficulty that we have about language is, so in order, let's say you have a poll here and a poll here. Sometimes you have to speak in a binary way, black and white, spirit or no spirit. Okay. Sometimes you have to speak in more of an analog way. It's not all the way one or the other. The difficulty that we have in language is you need both systems. And theologically, you can see this all the time at its, as, as it, as it, at its extremes. Christian or not Christian? Okay, that's a really fundamental distinction that everybody uses. But... Part of what's happened over the last 2,000 years is so much Christianity has gotten into all of our systems and our imaginations that, well, in some ways you you can say Christian or not Christian. In other ways, almost everything around us has been impacted by Christianity. So you you need both language systems. 
And, and Paul switches between them a lot. Sometimes he's speaking in a very binary way. The most binary book of the New Testament is the first epistle of John. Black and white, Christ, Antichrist, darkness, light. The whole book is just bang, 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 bang. All hard differentiations. And then you have, and Paul can talk that way, but then you have other moments where, and again, I'm going to talk about this with respect to the church at Corinth. On one hand, Paul is like, so the church itself thinks it is the epitome of what a Christian church should be at its day and time. We are the best church of the Roman Empire. We have the most spirit. We've had the best speakers. We have the most money. We have the most spiritual gifts. We are God's gift to the Christian church, the church at Corinth thinks. Paul looks at them and says, you are a disaster. You're an absolute disaster. You have absolutely no idea what you're doing. And to make matters worse, someone who, let's say, is a really bad Christian and knows it is a little bit ahead the person that thinks they're the best Christian and thinks that way. And this, again, is part of this binary versus analog. And so Paul says to the church of Corinth, you're an absolute disaster. But then he'll turn around and say, but you are in Christ. And so all of these things are true of you. And, and you want to sort of stop Paul and say, have you read your own letter? How on one hand can you be a church for which all these horrible things are true and you then go and say, you are this in Christ. We find Paul doing that all the time. And it basically gives witness to this, this reality that on one hand, the world is full of binaries. But on the other hand, the world is full of grays. And both are true. It's just figuring out how to act because of those truths and how to speak with respect to those truths is really difficult. But you know this as a parent. Parents manage this all the time. Um, parents will discipline their child and say things that are tremendously binary. Don't do that. It's very binary. Do, don't. It's, it's right there. But at the same time, it's still their child. And so what happens with parents is they get caught in these, between the binary and the analog, and it's a really difficult thing. Because on one hand, let's say you're the child, you're the parent of a drug addict. Well, on one hand, they're a drug addict. There's a binary. And if they're an addict, they are probably robbing and stealing to fund their habit, and you should put them out of your house. On the other hand, they're your child, and you don't want to see them on the street. And so you're just caught in there. And nothing they will do means you're not their child. But because they're a drug addict, you put them out. And then you put them out. And then they'll turn around and say, how could you let your child live on the street? Bang, another binary. I don't want my child living on the street. It's just back and forth. These are the kinds of things that, that, really, that really are difficult. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Paul has a real sense of C.S. Lewis puts this, puts this very well. If you want to get someone to do something, put them into a state of fear. We are heading into another election season, and what we will see in the election season is the two political parties putting a lot of energy into fear. If this person gets elected... The world is coming to an end, and both parties will do it. That is what it will happen, and it will get more and more crazy right up until Election Day. The difficulty that you have is once you call the other political party evil and monstrous and destructive and all of those things, the day after the election, guess what? Now you have to work with that monster, and well... The structure is set up in such a way that you can't work without that monster. 
So what are you going to do? You're going to be a purist and say, I'll never work with them. Fine, walk away from the system. Some people are like, tear down the system. Fine, what do we have then? Then all we have is fear and threats and brutality and violence. The whole purpose of the system is to have conversation instead of bloodshed. So we're caught in all of these traps. Paul makes the point that the Holy Spirit does not motivate us primarily by fear. Now, read the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So on one hand, Paul says, we're not motivated. The Spirit doesn't, you know, well, let's read. The Spirit does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, you had a little bit of nuance there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Does that include, let's, let's say if we have in fear, so fear, we might say respect, Anxiety, terror. Okay. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You ask a lot of people, what does that mean? Does it mean terror? No. It means mostly respect. But sometimes a little anxiety isn't a bad thing. And terror has its place. Another, but for, let's say, you have a relationship with, uh, let's say you're a child and you have a relationship with your parent. Probably in a healthy relationship, all of these three are going to be present. But it, in proportions, it might be 90% respect, 8% anxiety, 2% terror. It's probably the proportion that you should have for a healthy relationship. And again, okay, back to the binaries. Fear or no fear. Should you be afraid of the water? Well, you should have a healthy respect for water. You should have a little bit of anxiety for water, depending on the circumstance. So you go to a placid lake and, well, I hope you know how to swim. But a placid lake is fairly manageable if you have some swimming skills. Now, if the lake is large and you decide you want to swim all the way across the lake, well, a little anxiety should kick in. If you are, let's say, hiking in the foothills near the American River today, you should definitely have respect for that river. You should probably have some anxiety about when you get close to that river, and if you fall into that river, terror should kick in and fight or flight and adrenaline should hit the numbers because that river is going to take your life, okay? And you can see where terror isn't a bad thing. It has its place. Anxiety isn't a bad thing. It has its place. Respect isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it also has its limits, now, if you know someone who is living 20% respect, 70% anxiety, and 10% terror, they're probably going to be on medication because they're just anxious all the time. And they're burning through their reserves in their body and they're aging quickly and they'll die young of stroke, heart attack, or probably fleeing from something that they shouldn't be terribly afraid of, and off they go. So, but if you have a text like this, the spirit does not, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Slavery is a lot of terror, and rightly so. So that you live in fear again, rather, now when Paul says again, what does he mean? Well, because that's how you lived. Just, just do a little bit of reading of anthropology. I remember reading about the Navajo with respect to spirits. A lot of terror from spirits and anxiety from spirits. 
and some respect with respect to spirits out in the world in the Navajo worldview. And if the main way someone or something is getting you to behave in a certain way is fear, it's actually not a very good system. Because once you are sort of removed from the fear, you're going to revert to back what you did before. It's sort of like, again, raising a child. You raise a child, there's a little bit of terror, there's more anxiety, hopefully leading towards respect. But if you know the only way the child is going to clean their room is if you're riding them, well, then you know at some point when you stop riding them, the room will not be cleaned. What you want to do is instantiate within them a capacity to do these things themselves. That's the goal. Now, it's interesting. Let's look at some of the other translations. For all of those who are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. For we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Okay. Why would he talk about adoption and why would he use a little bit of Aramaic here in the middle of his Greek? Why on, and you can find this in lots of war stories, why in foxholes do soldiers cry out for their mothers? They want comfort. They're terrified. What's mama going to do for them? I mean, <laughs> I mean, their mother is continents away, and they wouldn't want their mother on the battlefield. But they cry out for their mother. It's natural. It's instinctive. And they do it in a way that is intimate and very deep. And that's part of why... You know, it's very interesting if you look across languages, how much, um, how much commonality there are between ba, ba, and da, 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 ba, 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 ma, ma. I mean, these deep, I mean, why all this commonality among languages? Probably because for infants, some of the first sounds they can make Ba 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 da da da. Mm, mm. These are these are some of the first sounds that the infant does this, and then suddenly there's a response from mother, and so it's back and forth, and so there's this formation that happens. Ma 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 ma, and mom's eyes light up, and you know this is intergenerational, um, back and forth. Ma 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 ma. Da, 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 ba, 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 ah, ba. That's Aramaic for daddy. Ba, ba, ba. And so we cry. And, and part of why I think Romans 8 is so beloved is it's so deep. And it's deep within us psychologically and developmentally. And so what happens is that People have a sense, now we're going to talk, use this word again, the world. You see this developmentally too. Child grows up in a good home. Good home is in some ways a little artificial cocoon made by the parents in which they're sort of a really, if it's a good home... <laughs> There's a healthy economy, relational economy going on that allows the child to grow up with healthy expectations and relational practices that lead towards flourishing in life. One of the things that children in a good home learn is how to trust. Because trust is absolutely important with respect to relationships. 
Another way that people, another theory, psychological theory that people have used is attachment. What does that mean? If your mother is good, you can trust your mother and just your relationship to that one person will be a guide to a world bigger than you can know. And that's what little children instinctively do. Because the mother is older and knows the world, and so the child can't know the world, so the child looks to the mother for cues, advice, relationship, protection. And if the mother is good, the attachment between the mother and the child will be strong. And that attachment will teach the child all sorts of things about the bigger world that are sort of, and the mother doesn't even know she's doing this necessarily, sort of transformed through the mother into the child. And this is in fact fractal because think about before the child is born. Okay, so you have a mother and a fetus attached to the mother by an umbilical cord. How does the fetus get fed? Through the umbilical cord. What is the umbilical cord tied to? The mother's bloodstream. The bloodstream is tied to the mother's stomach, and the mother's stomach is tied to... So if the mother eats good things when she's pregnant, the mother is already filtering the world, and if the mother has good filters... The baby benefits from those good filters because the good things that the mother eats goes into the mother's mouth, through the mother's system, into the bloodstream, into the child. Think about that as the pattern. Now, think about the rest of the world and a mother and a small child. The mother knows where to take the child and where to not take the child. The mother doesn't just grab the baby girl and throw herself into the American River in spring after a very wet winter in Sacramento. No, because the mother knows she's got respect, anxiety, and terror, and she manages that. And so when the child, as the child watches the mother, the same pattern that happens as the mother was eating good things and bringing it to the child, that mother is a filter of all the things in the world and it goes all the way down to the child. And neither the mother nor the child are conscious of this process that is going on all the time. So, And we find it in all sorts of other things that seem incidental. My mother always bought this product to make this food. Hmm. Your mother was filtering all the products available and saying this one is good. And so a little child or a teenager doesn't have time to test all the products. I just do what mama did. See, mama is a filter. And if the mama is good, she's a filter of the whole world. And the child goes up with the filter of the mother. And so in a good home, the child grows. But there comes a point when the child has to go out into the world and hopefully the filters of the mother do well for the child as she goes out into the world. And now Paul is saying we have a spirit of adoption. Now he's talking to people who have been brought up in the Roman world. And if you read chapter 1, Paul says about the Roman world, the wrath of God is displayed against the world outside now. He would say, well, the Jewish world, the world of the Old Testament, the world of the Torah, was a far healthier world. But even that world was insufficient, and this ties into this long tradition in the prophets where they look at the children of Israel and say, you haven't kept the covenant. So Paul says, now we've been adopted into Christ and Christ is giving us new filters, just like the mother has those filters and 
we are beginning to engage in the larger world, in God's world, in a new way. But in the midst of this, we cry out, Abba, Father, just like the soldier cries out for his mother on the battlefield. The Spirit himself confirms to our spirit, remember, our spirit isn't obliterated, that we are children of God. Okay, what does that mean? Remember how the child brings in the filters of the mother and is blessed by it? Now also, this is tricky, I've, I brought up this metadivine realm and the pagan imagination of the world. So the metadivine realm, which is controlled by these gods up in the sky, and people manage with respect to allegiance, um, transactions with these gods. In the Hebrew conception of the world, there's not a metadivine realm. God is arenic. In other words, the world isn't just sort of an impartial or evil space in which we work. But the world itself, and nature is in here with us, is all under God. You can even see it on our money. One nation under God. Now you can imagine God as being a little subset, or you can see God as being, in fact, the ground of being, the source of being, the author of creation. And so to be children of God, well, why is Jesus often called the Son of God? What, does, what would it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay, he's heir of God. Now, they're, they're thinking that in terms of a metaphor, an arena of a king and a prince. A prince is a very interesting figure in a kingdom because on one hand, he isn't king yet. On the other hand, he's sort of king already. So when the prince comes visiting a town, everyone, hmm, He's, this is the future king, but he's here right now. You might not get a chance to meet with the king, but the prince is here now, so act towards the prince as you would towards the king. Okay, all of these lines are connected in there. He's the representative. And, and again, if, we, if, if you understand the purpose of chapter 8, addressing all of the issues in chapters in chapter one, about the brokenness of creation. Well, the prince doesn't fear the rushing American river. Why? Because he controls it. And this is what we see with the miracles of Jesus. He stills the wind and the rain on the Sea of Galilee. He multiplies the loaves and fishes. He turns water into wine. He is the Lord of creation, and creation obeys him just like my hand obeys me. That's who he is. Now we are children of God. Does that mean the American River will obey us? Maybe. Now? Not now. We're not yet grown up into this. But this is the family we have been adopted into. And once we kind of see that, again, one of the clearest pictures of this I find in C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, especially the last chapter, Miracles of the New Creation. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now notice what happens with Christ. So you have God, Son of God, and now we are adopted into the family as heirs. And so on one hand, Jesus is our master. Towards the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus makes an amazing statement. 
On one hand, they understand that he is their master, but then he stops and says, I call you my friends. Now, we hear that and we think, mm-hmm. but in the Roman context, they understood what that meant. And we have a sense of that. If you go all the way back to the Bill Clinton administration, there were friends of Bill. What what, what do you mean a a friend of Bill? Bill Clinton was known to have had friends. I mean, he was governor of the small state of Arkansas. Some of you Brits might not know quite where that is and what that's about, but he's governor of the small state of Arkansas. And then when he came to the White House, Guess what he brought with him? His friends. Those other folks from Arkansas. Jimmy Carter did the same thing from Georgia. Now, sometimes that winds up being a good thing, and sometimes that winds up being a bad thing. And so friends of Bill and friends of Jimmy sort of had a little bit of nuance after a while. But these now, you are heirs, and now suddenly you are co-heirs with Christ. And so you are both beneath Christ, and in that way, Jesus is sort of an older brother. He's the firstborn among the new creation. But we are not only his disciples, we are also his friends and co-heirs with him of a new creation. If indeed we suffer together with him, so that we may be glorified together with him. And you'll you'll catch this in the sermons. You'll catch this in Paul all the time. Now, my knowledge of Buddhism is cursory at best. But the little I understand is, in many ways... A lot, of peop- a lot of people want to say that the problem in the world is suffering, and suffering is evil. I'm not going to tell you suffering is good. But it seems suffering can be instrumental. And I don't think this should be hard for any of us to understand. The parent, and, and this is in some ways built into sort of the origin story of Buddhism, Because Siddhartha Gautama, this is sort of the origin mythology of Buddhism, there was a young prince born into a kingdom, and his father didn't want him to see or touch any suffering at all. So he was never, his whole growing up years, he was never allowed to be sick. He was never allowed to see a sick person. He was never allowed to see a person who was crippled with age. He was never allowed to see a poor person. And so that way, free from suffering. And then the prince slips out of the um, slips out of the castle, and basically a god appears to him as an old dying person. There's a lot of different versions of this story. Christianity doesn't equate suffering with evil. It's ideas about suffering and evil are far more nuanced. And and partly we know this because of parenting. The good parent allows and sometimes brings in the right amount of suffering for the child to grow. Now that's really hard. Because, and this is part of the thing, if you have multiple kids, your kids are smart, they're going to very quickly realize, you're supposed to be fair, oh parent, yet you don't seem to discipline all of us exactly the same. And the parent will say, that's because you all need slightly different punishments or training. Some children will burst into tears at merely the hint of disapproval or disappointment. Other children, <laughs> oh no, they're going to they're just going to keep barreling through. And so to get the attention of some children, 
takes almost nothing. To get the attention of another child takes a lot. And, well, you'll notice that a child that has shown no limits will eventually find the limits. They'll find the limits out in the world or they'll find the limits in the criminal justice system. And so, again, what you want for the child is to internalize the mapping, internalize the filter, internalize the limits. So we are heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer together with him so that we may also be glorified together with him. Now, there, there's a way to think about this. If you... So think about, again, an arena. And this arena is a group of high school students that are now sort of leaning into their rebellious spirit. And this whole group is playing around with uh, sex, pot, and alcohol, let's say. It's not an unusual story for a bunch of teenagers. Now you've got someone who is standing outside of them. What's going to happen? Now it's interesting because on one hand you might say, well, if this person doesn't want to participate, what is that to them? Oh, but that's not how we work. There's a lot more subtle stuff going into it. They want this person to participate for lots of different reasons. The beginning of the Gospel of John talks about the Logos, the world made, the Word made flesh comes into this world as light into darkness, and the darkness hates it. Hmm. If you put these two pictures together, this group is going to try and make this person suffer until they capitulate. Darkness is going to try to make light suffer until it capitulates. But you can see even by, it, it's, it's, it's amazing the way the prologue to the Gospel of John works because on one hand, we can sort of have a sense, a, a, a metaphorical, symbolic sense of the fight between light and darkness. But in reality, darkness doesn't really stand a chance. It always gives way to light. If you introduce light into a dark room, light must win. Darkness goes away. But the prologue to the Gospel of John notes that there is a struggle between them. And this struggle brings in suffering to the light. And I think that's part of what's happening here, that Part of how we know Christ is in us is we suffer. And this is a really hard thing for people naturally because people pastorally will come and they'll say, I'm suffering and God won't do anything about it. Well, I don't know that we can say God won't do anything about it. And I think it's a little shallow to say God is causing the suffering there is usually more going on. Sometimes the suffering is the wrath of God because we have acted in a way, in a system that we shouldn't act. And so we receive suffering. Sometimes suffering is sort of a reverse polarity and we suffer because we're doing right in a world, in an arena that is set wrong. And so, so let's say you have this situation of this, of this group of kids in high school, and right now it's really cool in American society to be the rebel, to be, to be the one who's playing around with, with sex and drugs and all of that, and they're making this person suffer. 
because they're not participating. Fast forward 30 years. Probably a bunch of these people are going to be suffering because of what they did then. And this person who resisted is probably pretty glad they resisted <laughs> because the consequences of all of their actions were not immediately apparent. And we can see something of the wrath of God in this dynamic. But in this moment, they suffer. And so what Paul is sort of saying is that in this world, we will suffer because we are light in the darkness, because we are stepping out of something which seems to be a short-term win, but is a long-term bad bet. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed in us. So you have, let's say you have in college, you have the partiers and the nerd. And the nerd, the nerd is suffering. The nerd doesn't have many friends. The nerd doesn't have much status. The nerd isn't cool. 30 years later, the nerd is running a big tech company, has all the sorts of things that all of the cool kids never even got close to. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed in us. For the eagerly expecting creation awaits eagerly, um, uh, awaits eagerly the, re the revelation of the sons of God. Okay. So you have the author. Bless you. You have nature. And our relationship with nature is interesting. Nature is often sort of seems to be a mother, and you hear mother nature all the time, but nature is also a sister. We have sort of that weird relationship with nature because, well, let's think of it this way. The original hierarchy in creation was God, nature, and then I'm going to use this, vice regent. Now, that word doesn't really, isn't used in America because this is basically a word used in monarchy. But if you read the creation story, human beings, the reason we sort of have this weird mother-sister relationship with nature is on one hand, we are the crown of nature You see that in Genesis 1, and you see it at the beginning of Genesis 2, but we are also the stuff of nature with the breath of God. So you can see us in many ways as sort of a in-between being, okay? We have the breath of God, and we have the stuff of nature. And we see this all over the place. Right now, we are anxious about the state of the environment. And let's say, let's break that down into chimpanzees. We are worried about gorillas and chimpanzees. Gorillas and chimpanzees are very intelligent animals. And we're worried about the fact that there aren't very many gorillas left in the wild. Are the gorillas worried about the fact that there aren't any many gorillas left in the wild? Not that we can see. Why aren't they? They're the gorillas. We have a perspective that the gorillas don't have. We have a perspective that the orangutans don't have. Orangutans are amazing creatures. They're smart. They're social. The orangutans aren't worried about their existence. 
we don't find orangutans marching down the street with signs about the environment. The orangutans have failed to organize. We, however, are in the middle. We are the breath of God and the stuff of earth. And so nature, and remember chapter one is really about fall. Nature is in rebellion. Nature is red in tooth and claw. Nature, you go to that, you go to that fork of the American river right now and stand on its bank and jump in. The river cares not about your loved ones or your family or anyone else. That river will take your life. And every day you turn on the local news now and, you know, authorities up in Placer County have reported the death of blah, 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 blah. Or right now on the news, did you see that little clip about the woman who tried to pet a bison? <laughs> Edie, Edie grew up in that area. It's like... Yeah, you're, that bison is not a stuffed animal in some national park store. That bison will kill you faster than you can realize. That is a wild animal weighing between, you know, 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. It is brimming with muscle and they're fast. You can't run away from a bison if a bison decides to chase you. I remember we were up in that area and I was with a, a buddy of mine was from Bozeman and I was there with a couple other friends and we were doing a little bit of hiking and suddenly we realized we we're 20 feet from a bison and our friend from there said, get up a tree. Because one of the things bisons don't do is climb trees. Now the bison didn't do anything because in that area, bisons have sort of figured out that people are kind of, are not really dangerous, at least within the park boundaries. But if the bison feels threatened or feels like, like its calf is threatened, It'll take you out. That's the state of nature right now. And, and the idea is that, well, how can we understand this? Well, nature has understood what danger we are. And so it will take us out. We are at war with our sister. Well, what does Paul say? For the eagerly expecting creation awaits eagerly the revelation of the sons of God. And I like the way this particular translation, it makes for difficult English, but it's built into the passage. On one hand, and we feel this tension, on one hand, nature is our enemy. That bison will take you out. That river will take you out. The age of decay will take you out. Nature kills us all. But there's another side of nature that waits for her little brother to finally grow up to be the master her little brother was intended to be. Just in the way that my hand is perfectly or almost perfectly in obedience to my mind. Now, if I'm practicing my violin, I'm at the limits of the degree to which my hand is my servant. And what practice means is that I teach my hand to do the right thing. But that's at the limits. Right now, it's super easy. I can hold this pen, partly because when I was a little baby, I practiced and practiced and practiced with all of this stuff. And the vision here is that nature will... Now, remember I said, when the Spirit comes in, it doesn't eliminate us. The Spirit dwells with us, and we have within us a divine personality to train our much shorter-lived personality to be part of the entire whole. That is what all of, that is what Christ that is what Christianity, that is what creation, that is what all of this is for. All of this is for us becoming, and why do we as Christians say us becoming like Christ? Because that's where we saw it manifest. When he stilled the storm, 
when he turned water into wine. But now, such power, better be careful with that power. We might think, yeah, water to wine is a real cool thing. Um, if, if you turned Lake Tahoe into wine, you would destroy Northern California. <laughs> it would be an absolute disaster if Lake Tahoe was wine. It needs to be water. But in this one instance at the miracle of Cana, water to wine. And it's that kind of governorship, it's that kind of mastery that Christ has that the Spirit of Christ is growing us up into. Okay, so we're going to talk about that more next week. We're, we're, we're nearing the end. This is the crescendo of this section of chapters 1 through 8. And we're out of time. Let's pray. Lord, something within us gets excited when we begin to imagine what you have in store for us and what you are leading us into. And Lord, we don't know the steps and we, we don't know, we, we see here the roughest outline and the goal of what we will become. And right now we, we, are, we are sort of like that infant in the bassinet that is just trying to get a handle on the use of our hands. But Lord, this, this vision, this glimpse that Paul gives us of what your design for us is, is breathtaking and beautiful. Help us, Lord, to be gripped by this vision that we might pursue Christ and eagerly pursue Christ so that all of creation may be renewed and we might enter this inheritance that you have prepared for us. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen.